Okay, wait a little bit for more people to trickle in. So they just open the room. Oh, that's my Zoom window. Right there. Uh, that. Okay, wait a little bit. Um, but yeah, we'll get moving in just a minute. Okay, Jackie, I'll start uh, moving now. I'm sure more people trickle in. Uh, I don't know how long this one will take, so probably good to get started. Um, so I think I mentioned uh, last time um, that would sort of be bounding for a minute back to more um, kind of applied stuff that we'd spend some time on pivoting like we did last time and try to like show you some nice applied stuff that you'll probably use in a lot of your projects. Um, before we pivot back to uh, something else that's sort of um, abstract and technical and a little bit harder. And so I bring to you the hardest lecture of the term for most people. This will be the sort of uh, the peak. It should be smooth after this, um, which is talking about loops. And this is probably the most technical and difficult lecture for most people in here. So I kind of put it right in the middle of the class. So we kind of arc up to it um, right after that period where most people are committing and they're not going to drop the class at this point. Um, but we can still taper it off afterwards and it won't be so bad. So if you didn't know any better um, and you wanted to take that Swiss data set from the very first uh, homework, the very first week of class, and you wanted to get the mean of every variable in the data set, you might do something like this. You might go ahead and manually calculate the mean of each variable, assign it to an object, and then produce a vector of all of those different means so you could just display each one of the means. Yeah. So this little example of code here sort of displays um, this, the main problem you get with doing non-iterative operations for calculating repetitive things. Um, people are bad at typing and you make mistakes when you do the same thing over and over again. We're basically the opposite of a computer. Computers are fantastic at doing the exact same thing over and over again. And when you tell them to do something new, they break and they don't know how to do it. Humans, if we do the same thing over and over again, we tend to make mistakes. This is an example where there's many mistakes littered throughout this one, some of which are easy to see. You might notice things like a missing dollar sign right here. You might notice something like mean five being repeated twice, a comma missing here, this being man six. There's a lot of little mistakes embedded in here. The problem is, is that some of these mistakes will kick you an error, which will let you know you made a mistake, but other ones will not kick out an error because to R, you didn't make any mistake. These two lines right here do not look like a mistake to R. R thinks he wanted to calculate this thing and assign it to mean five and then immediately overwrite it again. If you put mean five in here, R just thinks you wanted the second one and never wanted this one. Those sorts of mistakes are very easy to make on sort of repeated operations when you're just typing lots and lots of code. Okay. Many problems here. So it's also problematic if you have lots and lots of these you need to do. If this is the only way you knew how to do an iterative operation like calculating means, you'd be very upset if your data set was really large. 200 columns is not even that large of a data set and it would already be a task that would take you a very long time to do. If you had something that had thousands of columns, do you really want to spend all day manually writing out these mean things with a thousand line script? Nah, you don't. It's kind of ridiculous, right? So don't do this or anything that looks like this. Uh, generally, instead of doing any repetitive any operation multiple times, you can replace it with something that makes the computer do that iteration for you because it's faster and better. 
Here's an example of a general solution, something that we're going to learn how to do today. Um, this is calculating all of the means of the columns in the Swiss data set using a loop instead of doing it manually. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over in detail exactly what's going on here because we're going to learn it today. That's sort of the purpose of today. Um, but the gist of it is what this is doing is it's creating an empty vector that it can store a bunch of values in. So this is just a place for it to put the means of all of the different uh, variables in the Swiss data set. And then what it's going to do is it's going to do this thing here that begins with a four. This is a type of loop, which is an iterative operation I'm going to spend a lot of time introducing here in a minute. <clears throat> the gist of it is it says we're going to assign a value to this Swiss means vector up here, which is a length equal to the number of columns in the data set. And then for each element of that vector, it's going to assign the mean of a particular column in the Swiss data set. And it's just going to iterate over every one of the columns in the data set. If I look at this Swiss means object after it runs, we get the mean of every single variable in the data set. So we've only called the mean function once in our actual code we've written, but R has run it six times for us by iterating over our data frame. Okay, This is kind of a nicer way to do it. In an example like this, it didn't save us much time probably overriding it this way, but it, this one scales very nicely. Okay, The idea here is this thing in computer programming referred to as the dry principle. Do not repeat yourself. Computers are way better at doing things over and over again than we are, like I was saying a minute ago. Writing code that repeats tasks for you instead of doing them tasks manually yourself um, reduces most of the most common mistakes people make when writing code, especially when writing really, really long code. It's usually just some sort of little mistake entered in because we don't like typing the exact same thing over and over again. Okay. Another thing is that this operation substantially reduces the amount of time it takes to process large volumes of data. And when I say reduce the time to process it, it's both your time you spend, which is the most valuable thing, and also computing time, which is less valuable but sometimes can be important. And another thing, this code will be very small. Small compact code is much easier to read and it's much easier to troubleshoot. If I made a mistake here in my loop, I only have to look over one or two lines of code to try and find where my mistake is. If I was running this over a lot of columns and I had 50 plus lines of this, I have to scan through a lot of text to try and find a problem. It's much better to have code like this where it has to be isolated in a small area than spread over tons and tons of lines of code. Okay. Um, so something I will say about this loop back here too, right? Um, if we wrote it this way, this scales linearly. Scaling linearly means for every additional variable in the data set, I have to write another line of code. This doesn't even scale at all, except in calculation time. If the Swiss data set here had 100,000 columns, I would not have to change a single character in this code. It would run over every all 100,000 columns and put it out for us. Not a character would have to change. This is something that's really nice about like loops and most iterative operations is that if you can, you can write them for a small test set or a small example and then change nothing and have it run over your entire data set data frame, which doesn't work for those individual operations. Okay. So the agenda for today, uh, today we're going to first talk about for loops and a little bit on while loops. These are general programming methods. Um, that apply to most programming languages in existence. We're just going to kind of talk about loops for a bit. Um, then at the end, I'm going to talk about, uh, after traumatizing you with loops for a while, how to not write loops, because it turns out it's better to usually not write them, but they're so powerful and useful, you need to know about them. Next week is going to be following up on these sort of principles of programming by teaching you how to write your own functions in R and how to loop and iterate using those functions which is sort of the, the real fundamental power of R comes with writing your own functions and iterating over those functions. Okay, so let's begin with loops. Uh, this is one of those examples where I'm gonna be bad and I will just cite Wikipedia because they have an excellent definition of what a loop is, one of the best and most succinct ones I've seen. 
A loop is a sequence of statements which is specified once, but which may be carried out several times in succession. The code inside the loop is obeyed a specified number of times or once for each of a collection of items or until some condition is met or indefinitely. That's broad. There's a lot of different sort of things that would define a loop, but the gist of it is that it executes some code inside a loop, and I'll talk about what that means, some number of times. That's all a loop is. It executes the same code over and over and over again until there's a reason for it to stop. Okay, so the first type of these I'm gonna talk about is the for loop, which is sort of the most general and commonly used one in data programming. So for loops are found in just about every programming language, uh, pretty much, I mean, if you, if you leave out, scr uh, not scripting languages, but if you leave out um, markup languages like Markdown and stuff, pretty much all of them have a for loop. Uh, the idea behind a for loop is you can imagine it saying this, for each of some set of values in order, do this thing, <clears throat> okay? So you give it some set of values and the set of values could be anything. It could be a set of individual numbers, but it could be rows in a data frame, columns in a data frame. It could also be individual data frames. It can be anything, just some sets of values, okay? So given a set of values, you're going to set some index variable, which is usually i, but you can use whatever you want, equal to the first value in this set of values. So if you have like five values, i would become the first one of those values. Then you will do some set of things, usually depending on that value of that index variable. Then once you're done doing that, go and check to see if there's another value. If there is another value, update your index to that value, go back to two and keep doing that until you run out of values. Once you run out of values, you exit the loop, the loop is done. The idea here is we are looping through these values, repeating some actions. Graphically, a loop looks like this, and this is why it's called a loop. So given some set of values that you have, Let's say we set this index variable i, we set it to the first value in our set of values. Then we're inside the loop. Inside the loop, we run our code that's in here using i in some way. It could be some very simple thing, it could be some very complicated thing. Then once it's done running the code, you check to see if there's more i values. If there are more values in our index, we say yes, set i to the next value, run the code again. If we have 10 values in our set of values, it would go looping around 10 times. Then when it's out of values, it would say, are there more values? Nope, get out of this loop and it's finished running. So that's the way they work. The loop is just running through this process until it runs out of things to do and then it stops. Okay, let's see these in action. This is a trivial loop in R. We're going to say for i in the values one to 10. So this function here, it's not actually a function, it's actually sort of declaring that something, uh, some uh, sort of programmatic statement is gonna follow. So for i, i is going to be our index variable. This here is gonna be what is going to be replaced inside our code with each one of our values in our set of values. So you say for i, in and then you give it a set of values. 1 colon 10 is the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is going to be our set of values. So what the loop is going to do is it's going to set i to 1, run the code inside the loop, then set i to 2, run the code inside the loop, then 3, then 4, then 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Okay, so in this toy example here, if I run the loop, this is the output I get, okay? You'll notice here, this is actually just the output of running the print command 10 times. And the only thing I've done is I've changed the value of i. So first it was one, so one squared is two, two squared is four, three squared is nine, so, so on up to uh, 10 squared is 100. The loop literally is just working as if you were writing the print command in your console replacing i with the relevant value from here and hitting enter over and over again. Does that make sense? So 
these things on the left side and on the right side are doing the exact same thing. <clears throat> this loop says 4i in the numbers 1 through 3 print i squared. So you get 1, 4, and 9. What the loop is actually doing, what it is actually doing is this. It's setting i to 1, the first value. It's running print i squared. Then it's assigning 2 to i, doing print i squared. Then assigning 3 to i and print i squared. The loop is not doing anything at all different than this. It's just taking care of doing this assignment for you, no matter how many values you have. That makes sense? It's not too much magic to it when you see it in a nice little toy example like this. Um, the power of it comes when you figure out interesting ways to iterate over things and change values and use them in more powerful ways, which is kind of what we're going to show today with what will eventually escalate to a pretty absurd example of iterating over things. Okay. So conventions on iterations. We call uh, whatever happens in a loop for a particular value. So if in that case, a particular value of i, so as long as i is equal to the number one, everything that happens while it is the number one is an iteration. Okay? So whatever happens in that loop for a single value is an iteration. It's very common in a loop to iterate over indices like one to n. That was the example I just did before. We're going to loop over one to 10 n here might be something like the length of a vector that we want to assign things to, or the number of rows or columns in a matrix or a data frame, or maybe the length of a list. There's all sorts of things you might iterate over like that. Common notation for loops that you'll see in R and most programming languages is that often i will be the object that holds the current value inside the loop. If you have loops inside of other loops, it's really common for people to iterate over i and then j, and then k. Usually i is inside, then j, and then k. This is just sort of arbitrary conventions borrowed from math. Okay? So the idea behind loops is very similar to indexing notation and mathematical symbols. If you've seen mathematical symbols like this in your stats class, this says, I want to take the sum of a bunch of numbers, the number amount of numbers, there are n numbers, and I'm going to begin with my index i equals 1, so I'm going to begin at the very first number. This is a loop. This is a loop that says I want to sum 4n numbers i set to 1 in the first iteration and then iterate until i equals n. Okay. Um, so the thing about that is, is if you see any mathematical notation that looks like this, you can write a loop and it will give you the same result. You can convert summation operators, cumulative product operators, things like that. You're literally just going to say for i in n sum i's, basically, and you can create anything you see a mathematical formula of. So if you're doing things like, say, writing maximum likelihood formulae and they sort of feature things like this, you could do it this way, writing loops, and you'll get the same answer. Okay. Um, a thing to note about this notation with the i's, the j's, and the k's, in R, i, j, and k are just normal objects you created, so you can name these things whatever you want. When I'm iterating over stuff like rows and columns of a data frame or matrix, I don't use usually i and j and k. I usually just name the object row or column. So I'll say something like for row in all of my rows. We iterate over that. And so I know exactly what I'm iterating over in the loop. We'll see examples of this as we go on today. OK. So thing about loops, you can iterate over any values you want. Like I kind of said earlier, you could loop over not just numbers, but you could loop over rows of a data frame, columns of a data frame. You can also loop over things like letters or words or sentences. Anything is a value that you can iterate over. So here's an example. I'm going to create a vector called some letters. Some letters is going to be the fourth through sixth letters of the English alphabet, which is the letters D, E, and F. If I say for i in some letters, just print i, it's going to print d, then it's going to print e, then it's going to print f. I can iterate over characters just the way I iterate over numbers. 
And the thing about loops is when you run a loop like a for loop for this, it creates the object I in your environment. And when the loop is done, it just leaves it in your environment. If I hit I at the end of this, it's just going to print F again, because that was what I was the last iteration of this loop. It's literally just creating an object as if you'd assigned it manually and then running this code over and over again, once for each new assignment of this value I. This all makes sense on here so far? to make sure the foundation of this is good because I'm going to cons constantly escalate this for this lecture until it is no longer good. Okay, so at some point people will begin to break and I'd like to know exactly when that occurs. You got a question? I see your hand. I don't hear your audio. Sorry, can you hear me now? Ah, yep, just fine. Okay. Um, I don't understand why I, when you just run I, it just equals F. Sorry, can you? Yeah, because it's doing this. This is actually what the loop is doing. So for I in one to three, print I squared, I get one, four, and nine. The loop is actually assigning first one to I, then two to I, then three to I. If I run this loop over here and I just hit I again, it's just going to give me nine again because the last operation of the loop assigned three to I. Does that make sense? Yep. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. Okay. So I keep getting an error. Some letters, objects, some letters not found. When I run some letters, letters four through six, make sure you're running that first line with the some letters here. You should have a some letters object in your global environment before running the loop. Is that the issue? It keeps returning the number 10 number for I mm -hmm. ah, that's from the loop earlier so that's probably the result from this loop all the way back where was it uh not this one this loop right here I was 10 at the end of this one so the question is why it's not so if you run exactly this code like literally just console print that paste that and it, what does it do does it not work for you I don't see a typo in yours. Uh, really? Yeah, no, it's not. What does it do? Um, there's nothing in the console. It just repeats the code. I can also worry uh, about this later uh, too. <laughs> so is there a little caret symbol like this in your console right now? No, it's a plus now. Ah, hit escape until the carrot appears. Now paste the code in. And it will work. I Means some of the code you ran earlier had a hanging parenthesis or squiggly bracket, and okay. it thought there was more to write. Now it's there. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, we can do that. So a useful uh, function to have uh, to use when you're writing loops is sequence along. Sequence along is a shortcut for one to length of the object you give it. So if you write sequence along x, it will create a vector, a numeric, well, an integer vector of the number one through whatever is the length of x. This is something nice to use when you want to loop over something that isn't a numeric index, but you want a numeric index of it to loop over. So here's an example of when that might be useful, or actually not really useful because it's a toy example, but this works. I'm going to say I want to create a loop for A. You see here I'm using A instead of I because it's arbitrary and you can use whatever you want for A 
in sequence along some letters. If you're following along, you could grab sequence along some letters, paste in your console and run it, and you'll see it's just a integer vector of the indices of some letters. So it should be one, two, and three. For A in one, two, three, let's print pasting together the text letter A colon some letters subset to some letters A. So to break this down, A is going to take a value of one in the first iteration of this loop. Sequence along some letters is the vector one, two, three. So for the first iteration, A is one. So you can imagine replacing everything in here with the number one. This means it's going to be letter one colon space some letters subset to its first element, which is the letter D, because some letters is D, E, F, bracket subsetting, right? So looping over this, it's going to say letter one is D because A is one. Letter two is E because A is then two and the second element of some letters is E. And then letter three, A is three, is F because that's the third element of some letters. Okay. And again, at the end of this, if you ran A, you would see A took a value of three. So this reveals how you can start to get more leverage out of loops. Because in this case, the thing we're iterating over is doing two different things. We're iterating over this vector of numbers, but the number is both printing an actual number and subsetting something to deliver us a different result. Okay. So we're going to kind of build on this idea where you can use what you're iterating over to sometimes perform multiple tasks simultaneously to get at some iterative operation we want done. Anyone have questions about this? Why do I use squiggly brackets? Ah, because the squiggly bracket is the way of the loop. So in R, squiggly brackets are a way to set aside um, multiple operations, multiple lines of code into their own little self-contained bubble. If you put something in brackets, it will run everything in those brackets before going on, kind of like a really big parenthesis. The thing is, is if you put a statement before those brackets, like for, it will run the things in the brackets based on the condition it sees here. In this case, the condition is a loop. So it says, we're going to do a for loop like this, Specifically, we want to run all the code inside the squiggly brackets over and over again. So without the squiggly brackets, you could do this, but you'd have to put all of the code on the same line as the statement, which would get awkward for big um, loops. For this, though, usually just write a squiggly, write squiggly brackets. We're going to see other uses of squiggly brackets uh, later today, actually. We're going to show you if statements and else statements, which use squiggly brackets. Ah, what's paste and how do you know when to use it? Paste is a handy function, which I'm going to introduce a lot more uh, the week after next in the lecture on strings. Um, what paste does is it takes uh, multiple vectors of text and turns them into a single vector of text by attaching all of the things together. So in this case, paste zero here is receiving this uh, the word letter, which is a length one vector, A, which is a length one vector inside the loop, colon is a length one vector. This is a length three vector subset to a single element. So there's four actual length one vectors here. What this paste statement is doing is it's going to jam all these together end to end to make a single element, um, thus producing, oops, excuse me, thus producing a uh, length a, a vector with. Uh, single elements, if that makes sense. You could experiment it, with it in uh, our studio, like so, by saying paste a b hats, and you'll see it just takes the individual a b and hats and makes a b hats into one element. Paste is just a crude way to just jam some things together. Uh, the difference between paste and paste zero is this: paste adds a space by default, and paste zero does not. Thank you. Okay, we'll see this a lot in two weeks. Okay, so something to know about pre-allocation. 
So usually when you're running a for loop of some kind, you aren't just printing the output like we've been doing in these toy examples. Normally you want to run some sort of calculation. You want to store the result of that calculation somewhere. Maybe you want to store it in a vector, a list, a row in your data frame, a particular cell in your data frame, something like that. Okay. The thing is with a loop, it needs some way, something to be there for it to put the values into. It just can't cast them into space into your global environment. So to figure out how to pre-allocate, that is to create an object to store these values in, you need to know what it is you're going to store, how many iterations your loop is going to run over, how many things it needs to write into this object. And what you'll normally do is you'll create an object with a whole bunch of missing values or blank spaces in it, and you will assign values to it one by one by one by one. Okay, so there's a lot of different things you could pre-allocate to uh, assign output from a loop. So these are all based on what your loop is going to produce. So if every time your loop runs, a single iteration of it produces a single number, you probably want to assign your values to a numeric vector. You can create numeric vectors with the command numeric and then the number of iterations. If you need to run a loop that goes 50 times producing a single number, you would go numeric 50, create an object with that, and then one by one, assign the output of your loop to each element of that numeric vector. If you're going to produce a, a single text output, and this could be something like a single letter, but it could also be, you know, a word or a sentence, you probably want a character vector for true and false values. You could use a logical, though you could honestly use anything. Um, let's say you have a loop where what it does is it produces an entire numeric vector of many, many values per iteration. If every time it runs it produces the same number of numbers so it doesn't produce a random some sort of unknown random number of numbers you could assign it to a matrix so you'd say matrix fill it with empty values nas the number of rows might be equal to the number of iterations so that each iteration of the loop writes a new row to the matrix and the number of columns would be equal to the length of the vector that's output by your loop so if your loop puts out a vector of five numbers every time it runs, and it runs 100 times, you would have five columns and 100 rows. Each row would correspond to the output of a single iteration of your loop. Now, if you're in a case where your loop is going to produce something bizarre, you have maybe either no idea exactly what's going to come out of the loop, or you need to produce complex objects, like say your loop every iteration it runs a model, and the model produces a list, just create a list with vector of type list with a length of the number of iterations. You need to run 10 models from your loop. You just want a empty length 10 list so you can put one model in each slot. We're going to do this later in this lecture where we run a whole bunch of models iteratively um, and then do something even crazier with those models afterward. Way to do that is stuff them in a list. In more advanced applications of R, you could do things like stuff a model inside a cell of a data frame, like a tibble using dplyr. I don't teach that in this class, but do know you don't necessarily have to use lists. There's a lot of more advanced ways to do this stuff. Okay. So here's an example. Ah, so here, what happens if you put in the wrong number of iterations? That's an excellent question. And one of two things will happen. If you put in too many, you're going to have an object that has a bunch of extra blank spaces in it. If you don't put in enough, R is going to kick an error when it runs out of places to put it. So what I normally like to do is to make it so the exact same definition in my code um, controls the number of iterations and the length of the thing I'm assigning to so that it's forced to always be correct. Um, later on, I'll show things that remove the need for pre-allocation. Loops require pre-allocation in general, but there's other ways you can do iterative operations in R that pre-allocate for you, but they're more advanced. Okay. So here's an example of controlling the number of iterations in the loop using the same code that I use to generate the pre-allocated vector. So here's what I'm saying. I'm saying at the beginning, I'm going to create an object called iters and assign the number 10 to it. This right here, this object iters, is just going to control the number of iterations in my loop later. I can set this to whatever I want. If I want this to run 100 iterations instead, the only thing I need to change is this number up here. Okay? So I say iters is the number 10. My output 
my pre-allocated vector I'm going to store some values in is going to be a numeric vector of length equal to the number of iterations. So this is a length 10 numeric vector. Numeric vectors, when you create an empty one, contains all zeros. because That's just the way R is. It doesn't start it with NAs. It starts it with zeros. So this is 10 zeros. Okay. So I'm going to say for I in 1 to the number of iterations, run some code. So here, iterations has set my pre-allocated vector to be length 10, and it's also said we're going to run 10 iterations of our loop because it's 1 to 10. Okay, so this kind of takes care of that wrong number of iterations problem. Okay, other times you will run code and not be sure how many iterations have to go because maybe um, there it's dynamic. Like every time you run it, it might have a different number of iterations. You have to do more complex things in that case. <clears throat> so here I say for i in 1 to 10, because iters is the number 10, assign to output element i the results from this math over here. It's some sequence I forget the name of. It's just i minus 1 squared plus i minus 2 squared, and then display the output. So this loop, right, is going to replace i with 1, then 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 for each iteration of this loop. So output, the first element of output is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 squared plus 1 minus 2 squared. Well, that turns out that's the number 1. Output 2, element 2, is going to be equal to plugging in 2s here, then plugging in 3s, 4s, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way up through plugging in 10 for this calculation. So again, the loop is doing multiple operations with what I'm iterating over. I'm iterating over all these values here, replacing i with each one of those values. But the i is both subsetting to the thing we're going to assign to and doing some math at the same time. OK, does this make sense what I'm doing here? No questions about this. That's confusing. Why output this time and not print? Ah. So this is an example here where if I wanted to use this output for something, I probably want to assign it to an object. The prior examples back there, printing would print to console, but I would they're just then gone. Like they're not stored in R, so I can't use them for something else. This would be an example where you actually care about the output. You want to use it for something. Maybe you want to plot it. Maybe you want to put it in a table, assign it to a data frame. So by assigning it to output, we now have this output object we can do stuff with. And this is going to kind of keep scaling. We're going to we're going to build on this to start writing things to objects, pulling things out, and then looping over things that we created with loops and so on. Kind of keeps building up. Any other questions on that? Okay. What you got? Yeah. When you so when you put uh, the output i in those brackets, you're essentially saying that this column will have this output 1, 1, 5, 13, 25. In this case, it's a vector, so it has elements rather than columns. It only has a length. So this is saying the first, like in the first iteration, it would be element one of output and the second iteration, element two of output, but basically the same idea. If it was a data frame, you know, you, you would do like, if you were doing columns, it would be um, blank comma I, and then it would iterate over columns. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this is where we're using our nice subsetting brackets we've used in the past, but now we're using them with something that's dynamic and changes over iterations and stuff, which is kind of why it's important to know about using the square brackets here instead of like dplyr stuff, because it's hella easy to use this in a loop, but it's really awkward to use a lot of the dplyr stuff in loops. Okay. Good so far? Keep chugging along. Here's a handy function I just like to introduce because I love it. Anything that allows me to be lazy and type less is useful. The function set names is really handy for pre-allocating things. So let's say we have a bunch of names we want to use for something. This is me using paste again. I'm saying I want to paste together the text iter space and then the letters one through five. Because of vector recycling in R, it's going to result in a length five vector where it repeats iter five times and attaches it to A, B, C, D, and E. It's a quick way to make some names I might want to assign to something I want to pre-allocate. 
Now, if you want to do that, let's say you want iteration A through E, and you want these as the names of a length five numeric vector, you could do this. Create a length five numeric vector, assign it to A vector, and then set the names of A vector to be the names I want to use. This would give you a vector that looks like this at the bottom. Iteration A, B, C, D, E. It's filled with zeros. So that's what a, a empty numeric vector looks like. But instead, we could save one precious line of code using set names. So instead of doing this statement here, its equivalent is set names of a length five numeric vector to these names and create the object simultaneously. So what set names does is it creates an object using this and names its elements at the same time. Thus, this operation here does the exact same thing as this operation here, but you write one less line of code. I show this to you not because there's any reason you normally have to use it, but every once in a while you get into an interesting situation where you cannot do this, but you can do this. Um, this is a common thing that happens when you're doing like loops and things where you don't have a way to use a normal assignment operator like this, but you can totally set the names on an object. It's good to know about this and remember it, even if you don't need to use it anytime soon. Okay. I use it all the time. Like I said, I'm lazy. Well, anything that shaves off one line of code is great in my book. Okay. So now begins the trauma. So we're going to go into a extended example with regression models, extracting things from them, plotting things, and then escalating it by doing cross-validation on those models to show you the powerful and crazy things you can do with loops. Um, and these are things you yourself might want to do at some point, and then you can build off of the code I've provided in this class rather than sort of um, being cast out into the wolves. Okay, cast to the wolves, rather. So the premise here. Okay, um, imagine we have some data, some sort of data set we have, and what we want to do is try to fit a bunch of different regression models to it. In this particular case, we're only going to fit a few models, but in principle, you could fit many, many models if you wanted to. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to store the results of fitting each one of these models as the elements of a list so that we can compare the results of each one of these regression models. So we want to run many models, store each model as a list element, and then compare each one of these list elements in some way. <clears throat> okay. So to do this consistently, we're going to write a loop. You could run the models individually in our exam simple example here, which only runs like four models, but this code I'm going to show you would scale really nicely. It would work the same way with one model or two models. It would work the same way with 200 models, 2,000 models, or 200,000 models. The code will work exactly the same no matter how many of them you have. Scaling code like this is really nice. So if you want to add something later, you don't have to do anything. You literally add like one more formula or something, rerun the code, you're done. Okay. So. After we run the models repeatedly, we're going to do something even more advanced. We're going to use cross-validation on these regression models to get an estimate of their accuracy in predicting out-of-sample values. This is a sort of machine learning style technique for validating, the, uh, for validating models to see which one performs better in an actual data set. Okay? So you're going to learn some complicated things here. If you don't have any statistical training, pay attention to the programming components of it. Largely ignore the statistical stuff. This is really about the programming. I don't really expect people are familiar with uh, linear regression in this class, but I imagine most people probably are. Okay. So to do this, I'm going to simulate some fake data really quickly. Uh, I'm not going to really get too much into what I'm doing here. Um, but the gist of it is I'm going to uh, set a seed so I always get the exact same results every time I run this uh, lecture. I'm going to say I want 300 observations by assigning 300 to n here. I'm going to generate some predictor variable x from a normal distribution, 300 observations of it with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 4 because those are arbitrary numbers I decided to choose when I wrote the slide. And then I'm going to create some simulated data. My simulated data is just a data frame where x is the x I just created, but y is some value calculated based on a function of x, in this case, negative 0.5 times x plus 0.05x squared plus some 
normal dis normally distributed error. R norm 300 SD1 is a standard deviation one random error term on here. Um, not that important. Okay, but this is sort of the general code. If you want to create like test data sets to evaluate something, this is how you'd simulate a simple data set that has, in this case, a quadratic relationship between X and Y. You can do this. Um, so there's a funny story you could click through if you're interested in here in the slides. Um, there was a big scandal in 2014 in political science um, when a grad student faked data for a big field experiment. It was a pretty influential paper. Um, I forget exactly uh, the, the study. I think it was essentially about um, people changing their um, evaluations on a um, uh, like one of those uh, barometers of their opinion of people um, based on interacting with somebody of the identity uh, that the barometer is sort of evaluating their feelings toward. Um, but like very often when people um, resort to faking data to get papers published, um, they're doing it in, to some degree because they're in general probably bad at this. And so when they generated their, he generated this fake data, he just used R's built-in R norm function to add noise to the data. So my advice to you is, um, other than don't falsify data, is if you are going to falsify data, don't insert standard normally distributed random error into things, because people like me can see that from a mile away. Nothing has perfectly standard normal distributed error terms, especially not things that are things that humans write onto a survey. Nobody on a t on like a temperature barometer about how they feel about life. How do you feel about black people? Nobody does like mm, 49. No, people clump around things like 50, 25, 75. They don't have a normally distributed error. This person did this because they were dumb. Anyway, our norm function is fun. Okay. So this is a quick plot of our simulated data. I'm just going to say ggplot, my data is the simulated data. X is X, Y is Y geom point and give it a type. Okay, So I generated these data with a particular functional form. This functional form is represented by the data right here. X is on the x-axis, Y is on the y-axis. My data kind of look like this. Now, if you have data that have a beautiful shape like this with regard to X and Y, you quite possibly know exactly the model you should fit to this to make it work well. And if you looked at the exact formula I used to generate it, you should know what sort of regression model will nearly perfectly fit these data. But we might have more complicated data. This might just look like a cloud, or there might be so many points we can't really figure out what's going on. We might want to try a bunch of different models and see which one works best. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So let's say we want to consider a bunch of different models to draw essentially trend lines through these data. This is a case where we have two variables. So we're doing a bivariate regression model. We're literally just drawing a two-dimensional line through these data, okay? These are the models we're gonna consider as candidate models and compare and see which one does the best with the data. We're gonna begin with an intercept only model. An intercept only model says, draw a horizontal line through the data and figure out what horizontal line best fits the y values. So this says the expected value of y given x is equal to some intercept. x isn't even on the right side of this model, so it totally ignores any information x provides us. It's going to fit a straight line based on the y values and totally ignore x. That's an intercept only model. Next model is a linear model, a basic linear regression model. This says, let's draw a line that best fits y based on a linear function of x. That is, we're going to assign a slope to x and draw a line that has a intercept and it has a slope. So the expected value of y given x is equal to some y-intercept plus a slope on x. This is going to make a straight line that either increases or decreases as values of x increase and decrease. Next, we're going to get a little more complicated. We're going to do a quadratic model. This says, draw a quadratic curve that is a parabola, either with the peak up top or the peak down below. A parabola that best summarizes the y values as a function of x. So the expected value of y given x is a intercept, a linear slope on x, and then some curvy slope on x squared. Well, technically speaking, it's a linear slope on a curvy x. Okay x squared will generate a parabola once centered. 
Lastly, draw a cubic model. Cubic model says draw a cubic curve that best summarizes the values of y as a function of x. This just adds a cubic term over here. I'll tell you right now that um, every additional term of polynomial you add to something makes a less realistic assumption about how the world works if you're working with actual real data. It's relatively rare for anything in reality to actually have a cubic uh, sort of functional form. Sometimes in behavior, you see it across certain sort of predictors. Um, age is one that sometimes exhibits cubic forms for things like deviance, like drug use tends to be cubic because it peaks in like adolescence, drops through middle age, and then goes back up when people retire, funny enough. Um, stuff like that. Anyway, most things though don't actually have like cubic terms. In fact, most things people model with a polynomial, the polynomial is actually just picking up omitted variable bias. Anyway, so that's that. So we're going to fit models based on all these different things using a loop. Okay, so to do this, we're going to build up with uh, a little bit of foundation here. We need a few things stored as objects in our environment to work off of to run our loops. First thing I would do here, and this is typically kind of more or less the process I would follow if I was running a lot of loops. Um, typically, I have some iterative code that actually generates these formulae here. Like in my dissertation, I've got a chapter that runs like 128 models to generate one particular plot. And so I have the code generate those these formulas for me instead of manually typing them. You can come up with your own way to do it. But the gist of it is essentially code doing what we're seeing here. So I'm going to create a vector called models. It's going to be a named vector. A named vector means it has values on the right side. The values are going to be formula. Y tilde 1 is the formula for an intercept only model. So I'm going to name it intercept only. Y tilde x is the formula for a linear model of y regressed on x. I'm going to call it linear. Quadratic formulas, this is one of many ways to draw to write a quadratic formula in a regression model in R. This is one of many ways to write a cubic model in R. So I'm going to assign them the names quadratic and cubic. This is a named vector. A named vector means it has only four elements like this. But if you wanted to subset this thing, you could subset it using its name. So really quickly, I'll show you. Yeah. Okay. So if I did something like this, <clears throat> run that thing. So my models vector is the exact code from the slides. If I type models, this is what that vector looks like. It has these quoted formulae, and each one has a name over the top of it, like intercept only, which means if I go models subset cubic, it spits out the formula for the cubic model. So if you're thinking ahead, you might imagine where this is going to go. We're going to use our ability to subset this model vector based on the names of the models to make it iterate over the names of the models and run each model one by one. And one thing I should probably also do is because I'm probably going to need to run examples of this, let me grab my simulated data and generate it real quick. Okay, now I got my sim data. Okay. Okay, so we got a named vector of models. Next, what we want to do, we're going to pre allocate a list to store these fitted models. So we know that models are list objects, and you generally only want to stuff a list object into another list. So we're going to pre-allocate a list. I'm going to call this list fitted LMs for fitted linear models. I'm going to assign to it a vector of type list, which is how you make a list, whose length is equal to the length of the model's vector. So this is going to create a length for empty list. Okay, I'm then going to assign the names of fitted LMs is going to be the names of my models. So if I display this empty list, it looks like this. It has elements named intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic. And right now it contains nothing. When you create an empty list, it's filled with nulls. A null in R is not a missing value. It's the absence of anything. It means there isn't even a slot there, really, you could put stuff in. There's literally just nothing there. OK, I'm going to grab this. So what we're going to do here, we're going to fit models in a for loop. So the idea here is that we will loop over our models vector. We will fit each one of these models, and then we will store it in the appropriate slot in the list we have created. Okay. So 
To do this, we're going to use a handy little function here called formula. Formula converts a character string which describes a model into an actual formula object you can read with LM. So in R, you're probably used to seeing formulae written like this. I could say something like LM, uh, let's see, eh, MPG tilde weight data equals MT cars. I can run that and get a regression model of miles per gallon on weight in the MT cars data set built into R. Notice how I wrote the formula though. I wrote it MPG tilde weight with no quotes around it. If I quote it, it still works. So in this particular case, I probably don't need to do formula, but back in the day, you used to have to quote it. I was actually running that there because I couldn't remember if they made it over the many years since I first started doing this, that you can use quoted ones or not. Looks like it's quoted, so technically maybe I don't need formula here. I always do it out of practice though. Okay, so here's our example here. What we want to do is run a bunch of models. Here's my loop to do it. We're going to say for a given model in the names of the models, do this operation. So what is names models? Names models is this. Names models is intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic. So that means for every iteration of our loop, the variable mod we created, the object mod, will first be intercept only, the text, then the text linear, then the text quadratic, and then the text cubic, right? Okay, so for mod in names of models. Let's run through this loop one time verbally using a value of mod. So imagine we're in the first iteration, mod here, Everywhere you see mod is replaced with the text intercept only. So what this is saying is take the fitted LMs list, subset it to the element of the list named intercept only, and then assign to that the result of a linear model using a formula. The formula is the model's object subset to the model named intercept only. So model subset intercept only is y tilde one, the intercept only model, and our data is equal to the simulated data. This here, data equals simulated data, notice it doesn't have mod in it in any place. This means this is the same in every single iteration. The only things that change in our iteration are which formula I'm giving the linear model and which slot in the fitted LMs object I am assigning it to. Okay, that makes sense. I'm gonna grab this and I'm gonna run it and I'll show you the output. Do I have it? Okay. I run my loop. You see it's very fast. It's very quick at running lots of models. If I look at fitted LMs, fitted LMs now contains all of these linear regression models. The intercept only model, which only has an intercept, you can see it's formula here. It says formula equals formula models mod. It doesn't populate it with the actual formula we gave it. It's the literal call we used to run it. The linear model looks like this. The quadratic model looks like this. And the cubic model looks like this. It's estimated all of these models iteratively using our loop code. Okay. We can look at the component parts of this. So. If I say, for instance, eh, let's just grab that. Okay, this is what the first iteration is actually doing. Okay, that is the actual code being run for the first iteration. Fitted LMs, subset to intercept only run a linear model, models intercept only. Does this make sense? If I look at what models intercept only is, I mistype that. Do I have my models object? Oh, it's intercept only with a space. There we go. So that's all it's doing. Does that make sense? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um. 
So for what we've just done um, in the code where we're looking at mod, is that, or even just intercept only, is that like the, are we looking for the name or like the values that the name represents? We're using, so we're using the name and getting the value out. So like for instance, mod, so this is the last value mod took at the end of the loop, it's the text cubic. But the nice thing is that if we subset models using cubic, we get the formula. And if we subset fitted LMs with mod, we get that slot in the list. So it's getting two different things using the exact same name because they're named objects. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> this is sort of the power when you start to figure out ways to use the same information in multiple ways simultaneously to perform some sort of handy task. So of course it means that the difficulty here is figuring out the logic of how to do it. It's like, this looks beautiful in principle, but I know what I'm doing. Figuring out how to make this work nicely is sort of the game you learn over time. <clears throat> okay, so any other questions about that? Are we good? Because we're keep escalating. And I guarantee basically no matter where you're at, by the end of this escalation, something in your brain will be a little broken and that's okay. <clears throat> so this is the easy part of this. The next thing I want to do is, okay, what I'm interested in here, I'm not interested in the coefficients of this model. I don't care about those. What I care is how good a job it does predicting the actual values in the data, because I want to evaluate these models in terms of how well they can predict values. Right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a loop to extract predicted values from these models and plot them on my ggplot. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to say, I'm going to create a data frame to store predicted data in. I'm just going to take my simulated data and assign it to this predicted data object. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some columns to it of the predictions. What I'm going to do though, is I'm going to add a column of predictions for each model. So we're gonna add four new columns to our data set. The way to do this, I'm gonna say again, notice I use the exact same looping structure in every example so far. And I also in the count, the, the next thing, I'll keep using these exact same looping structures. I say for mod in the names of the models. So mod again is gonna be intercept only then linear quadratic and cubic. We're gonna run this code here. We're going to say subset to predicted data the name of the model. The thing is, if we look at our predicted data, actually, let me run the first line again to not be misleading. Okay. If we look at predicted data, uh, yeah, it's going to give me a head. Predicted data looks like this to begin with. It only has the columns X and Y. So if what I do is say assign to predicted data intercept only, what is that going to do? That column doesn't exist in predicted data. What happens if we subset to something in a data frame that doesn't exist and we assign something to it? new column. So if I just subset to it and it didn't exist, it would give me an error. But if I subset and I assign something to it, like I'm doing here, then it's going to create a new column. This is the interesting thing in R. You use the same operator to retrieve something out as you do to assign something to it. But if there's nothing there in the data frame and you assign to it, it makes something there as long as it fits. Okay. So this is very powerful. Yes, that's exactly what it is down there in chat. This is exactly the same thing here as doing predicted data dollar sign, for instance, intercept only and assigning something to it. It's how we create columns. You can create them using names as well. It is cool. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, I want to assign to predicted data to the column named intercept only the result of running the predict command on 
the fitted LM's object named intercept only. So this is going to be the results of the intercept only model. And its data for the prediction is going to be predicted data. It just so happens in this particular case, the predicted data is the exact same X and Y variables used to generate the model. So all we're actually doing with predict is generating fitted values in the models. If you wanted to just get fitted values, the easier thing to do would be to use the fitted function um, and it would just extract them for you. But I'm showing you predict here in case you want to change the data because we're going to do that in the next example. Okay, so we say, um, okay, this is fitted or this is intercept only, this is intercept only. The neat thing is mod changes for each iteration of the loop, which means for every iteration of the loop, it creates a new column in our data set, right? Because it creates a intercept only column, then a linear column, then a quadratic column, then a cubic column. So if I run this code again, and then I look at predicted data, uh, let's send it to head, not e had. Now it looks like this. We have our original X and Y column, but now we have new columns from intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic values. So our loop has generated all these new columns, which contain predicted values from each of the models for each value of X uh, in the data, right? Okay, and you can see some of these models these behave the way you'd expect. So if you have an intercept only model, an intercept only model predicts literally the same value for every observation in the data. That's what it thinks is the Y intercept. So it's the same here. Linear model, then quadratic and cubic. We would expect the quadratic and the cubic to be almost identical in this particular data set. Okay. Questions about that? So this is a slightly, still a fairly advanced thing. This makes sense. Any weird mojo going on here? Nothing too bad. Okay, I will continue to escalate. We'll see where we go from here. <clears throat> okay, so these are those predicted values, exactly the same things I showed you in the console. What we want to do, though, yeah. What you got, Yusuf? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so say you decided that you didn't want intercept, and then you just wanted um, uh, the other. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. the other. Uh, you just wanted to run the other regressions. Like, is there like what is the quickest way for you to to remove... delete this line and rerun it? Okay. Just yeah. Take it out from right there. Yeah. That makes sense. Or subset it somewhere else later and remove it. Um, you know, but probably the easiest would be to say, don't run this one. Same things if you wanted to run instead of running these models, you had some set, like I said, of like 100 models and you've got their formula and names. You just create a longer vector. And if you have a longer or shorter vector of models, you would literally change nothing else. So you could, I mean, if you're sitting there working on this code, you could make any arbitrary models you want here as a function of y and x add them to this list and you won't have to change a letter of any of this other code, it will run those models too. This is sort of the beauty of it is that this is all sort of packaged in a way where the only thing you got to change is this thing here and it can rerun all the models, generate all the predictions, everything without modifying a thing. Cool. Question, Kelly? Yeah, this is kind of going back, but um, just on that side, how do they know that those are formulas? I thought that when you had the quotations, it lumped it all as a string. Uh, so this is a string. Um, and so the thing is, is in R, uh, technically speaking, you can just give a string that looks like this to LM as its first argument, and it will convert it to a formula. I was explicit here where I said, um, formula models mod where models mod is each individual element of that models vector so there's the formula like y tilde or whatever formula explicitly converts it to a formula so if i show you like this if i say um in our like y tilde x that's just the text y tilde x if i type y tilde x with no quotes i see that well if i say class y tilde x it's a formula R recognizes this as a formula and it treats formulae differently than other objects. So class 
y tilde x is character. What I'm doing by saying convert y tilde x in quotes using formula is it turns it into a formula for me. So I'm just sort of like manually doing it. Interestingly enough, the LM function can actually handle those quoted formulae. I swear it didn't used to be able to do that, but maybe that's back to like a 2.0 R version that it wouldn't do it. Um, I'm old and I always forget what's changed over many years. So I try to be explicit about these things. <clears throat> that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So if we got values that look like this, I have all these nice predictions. If I want to draw my predicted values, that is these numbers here on a ggplot, does this look like a good format for plotting in ggplot? If I want to draw lines or something using intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic, does this look like a nice format for ggplot? If I left my data in this format, what would I have to do to plot a line for each one of these models? If I just do geom line and plot all of those columns, could theoretically layer it. I could do one, two, three, I could do four different geom line calls, but that would be awkward, right? And then if I had lots of models, imagine if I had a hundred models and for some reason I wanted a line for each one of them and I thought that plot would be useful. I don't want to write a hundred geom line calls. What might be a better way for these data to look? What do we normally want to give to ggplot? Yeah, we want long form data. What's long form data version of this gonna look like? What are our two variables here? There's four columns here for predictions, but there's actually two variables. There's a type of model, which is intercept only linear quadratic and cubic, which is right now stored in our column names. And there's a value, a prediction for that model for a given value of x, which is in these columns. So what we want to do is we want to pivot our data down so that instead we have a column for the model and a column for the prediction from that model. Okay, I'm going to do that. So to do that, we're going to use pivot longer, which we learned last week from the tidy R library. So I'm going to say load up tidy R and make tidy predicted data. To do that, I'm going to take my predicted data and then pivot longer the third through sixth column. I could have done it by names, but I just did it by numeric locations here. Column three is the intercept only model. Column six is the cubic model. I'm going to convert the names of those columns into a new column called model and the values in those columns to a new column called prediction. And then I'm going to mutate that model column, which contains the names of the models, into a factor whose levels are equal to the names of the models. This is going to turn it from being a alphabetically or arranged uh, variable into one that has them in the order we created the models. So its first level is intercept only, its last one is cubic, just to make the legend look the way that I want. Now, if I look at my tidy data, I get head, tidy predicted data. It looks like this. I still have X and Y, but for each value of X and Y, it's repeated four times. And I have a model and a prediction, model, prediction, model, prediction. This is a tidy data frame where for every value of X, it has four predictions, one for each model. This is a nice data set ready to go into ggplot. Because okay? now I can just say group on the model or color on the model plot the prediction and it will draw a line, one line for each model. Okay. So let's see. I'm going to use ggplot2 to do this like I normally do in this class, um, but I have to do one fancy little thing in here if I want to draw my lines going through all the dots on my uh, data. The thing is, is if I just do a geom point using these data here, every data point has been repeated four times. I don't want to draw four dots, but there's actually only one dot on each one. So I'm going to plot two different data sets at the same time on this plot. I'm going to say, I want to create a ggplot. I want the dots to be my original sim data. 
on x and y, but the lines, geom line, is going to be from my tidy predicted data. Their x values are still x, their y values are now the predicted values. They're going to be grouped and colored by their model. I make them partially transparent because they might overlap with some stuff I want to see. I make them kind of big. I give them um, a title and I make it theme black and white. Okay. We get this. These are the plotted predicted values from our regression models. So we can see immediately, right, that some of these models look like they're doing a much better job than other models. So if you look at this right now, what model looks best to you? Quadratic is a good one for me. Two of the models are indistinguishable, right? So you'll notice here, quadratic is kind of a turquoisey sky blue thing. Cubic is kind of a lavender. What we actually have is an intercept only model, a linear model, and then the quadratic and the cubic occupy an identical space across their entire range, generating a color that is halfway between the quadratic and cubic color. Okay? These models are giving exactly identical predictions across the entire range of data. So if you know, I mean, if you're taking a statistics class that immediately tells you which one of these models is probably better, it's the one that has fewer parameters, the quadratic model. But if you're doing something more complicated, it's kind of hard to tell, we might want to figure out another way other than eyeballing the data to guess which one is the better model, which is what we're going to do next. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about cross-validation. I'm going to scare you a little bit with uh, some statistics stuff and some uh, complicated coding. Um, but I'm going to teach you something here that is powerful and useful. And if you ever have to do cross-validation manually in some other class, you will have seen it and you can steal and adapt this code so you don't get traumatized by the experience of having to do a very complicated thing with, with essentially no programming background in it, which I had to do in at least two of my CSS classes way back in the day before I started teaching this R class. Okay, <clears throat> so um, yeah, cross-validation, basic idea is it's a method for estimating how well a model makes predictions on data not used to fit the model. So imagine that what you do is you take a data set, you leave out some of the data, you fit a model using it, but then you run predictions for the data that were left out. That's our process. So the procedure works like this. It's called typically k-fold cross-validation because the folds are how you break up your data. You split your data into k is a number folds. These are pieces. You could call it, if it's k is five, you break your data up into five pieces. So in this case, I think the example we're going to do, we're either doing five or 10. I think k equals 10 in our example, but you can do it. You'll sometimes see uh, cross-validation, but the largest one is called uh, leave one out cross-validation, which is when you take, if you had 10,000 observations, you do 10,000 folds, okay? Um, we're basically breaking our data up into 10 pieces. So you split your data up into however many folds you want. Then for each one of your folds, beginning at fold number one and going up to k folds, this is how you know we're going to loop for i equals one to k, we do this. We fit a model to all the data except the data in the fold we're currently on. If we have five folds, we'd fit our data using four of them. Then we make predictions for the data omitted in the fold we're currently on. So if we have five folds, we would leave out 20% uh, of our data, fit a model using 80% of it, and then make predictions on the 20% we left out. Okay. And then after doing predictions for every single one of those folds, we would calculate something like the mean squared error for all of the predictions we did across all five of the folds. Mean squared error is this formula right here. The mean squared error is equal to the mean of the squared errors. An error is the actual observed y value minus your prediction. You square it to get the squared error, and then you take the mean of it to get the mean squared error. Okay, we're going to calculate MSE. There's other things you could do, like mean absolute error, whatever you want. <clears throat> okay, so the idea 
is that a model that does a good job that fits data well will have a low mean squared error. Models that are too simple for your data will get a bad mean squared error. But the nice thing with MSEs and cross-validation is models that are too complicated also make bad predictions and will tend to have higher mean squared error. So cross-validation lets us penalize our models for being overly complicated, something that your eyeball test doesn't do well. Because every time you add an additional parameter, it's going to look better to the eye until you have as many parameters as you have data and it perfectly fits it. We don't want that. We instead want our model to do well, but not too well. That's what cross-validation helps us do. Okay. So in principle, graphically, this is what cross-validation is doing. So this is a iteration one for our cross-validation. So the very first iteration, this is the first fold of it. On the left side is our real data. Let's say Y and X, like the data we're working with right now. This is five-fold cross-validation. K is equal to five. So we've broken our data up into five folds. The folds are just different rows of our data. In reality, they'll be randomly sampled, but here I'm pretending we're just doing them in order. Okay, we're starting at the top of the data set. <clears throat> so what we do, okay, we're working on fold one right now. What we do is we ignore it for now. We fit a model using all the data in every other fold. So we say we model Y on X using folds two through five. But then what we do is we take the fitted coefficients, we take the estimates from this model and use the data in fold one and these estimates to fit predictions for Y. The predictions we're fitting them on are the y values in these data that were left out. We then assign those predictions over here to a data frame of predicted y values. Okay, so these are pre allocated open space. We then iterate over every single one of these folds until we filled up all of our predictions with predictions for fold one, two, three, four, and five, in which case every single one has been predicted using a model based on the left or based on the included ones, but predicted on values left out of the models. So the idea here is this is basically simulating the process of you fitting a model on data and then going out and collecting new data and seeing how well your model predicts values in that data. But what we're doing it is we're simulating that process. Okay. This is not a straightforward thing. Never have questions about this. A powerful tool, not super intuitive. It's sort of, it really is sort of um, simulating the idea of uh, running experiments over and over and over, over again. <clears throat> so are the folds random or like the first part of data? Random. Typically speaking, what you want is you want the folds to all be, um, you want any row in the data to have an equal chance of being in every fold so that the data are essentially the same across every fold. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Can you explain again? <laughs> yes. Okay. So cross-validation is not a straightforward thing. And so the more experience you have in stats, the easier it is to understand what it's doing. If you don't have a ton of experience and you've never seen it before, you're like, what the hell is this guy doing? And that's okay. Even if I re-explain it here and you don't understand it, read on it or ask me for resources, I'll send you more. You might never have to do cross-validation in your life, but you'll probably see people talk about cross-validation in journal articles you read and stuff like that. It's nice to know it is not a magical thing. It's a purely mechanical process for estimating the error in your models. Okay? So again, the gist of it, you split your entire, this, this whole thing right here is your original data, your data frame. <clears throat> Imagine you chop out about a fifth of your data in this particular example, and you run your model on all the other data. We're actually going to do this here in a second, so you'll see it programmatically. We run the model using this. We then pull out the coefficients, right? The coefficients are like, you know, um, the intercept plus the beta value on X for a linear model. We extract those coefficients. We then literally just uh, calculate a predicted value by taking, let's say, our intercept is zero and our beta is 0.5. Our prediction would just be zero plus 0.5 times each one of the x values in this row. We would assign those predictions here. That's it. We extract those predictions. We do that over and over again for every one of our folds, giving us five sets of predicted values, which correspond to um, that sort of process we just did before. 
for the last fold right, we take the first four fifths of our data, fit a model on it, use the last fifth of our data with those coefficients to make a prediction. Once we get done with running all these predictions, we just look at the difference between these predictions and the actual Y values. And a good model has small differences. A bad model has big differences. The thing I like about cross-validation is you don't really have to know um, a lot of like statistical theoretical stuff. It's a purely programmatic thing. So instead of learning about how like certain kind of complex fit statistics like AICs and BICs, like information theory measures work, you can instead just mechanically do this and it's purely intuitive. It's like, leave some data out, fit a model run a new model or run predictions using what we left out as if we'd encountered new data. If our model does a bad job, we have a bad model. That's it, right? <clears throat> so you can imagine this in terms of like the stock market, which is like the worst place to run prediction models because you're basically always wrong. Um, but you can imagine like the stock market. You come up with a model that beautifully predicts stock prices in your data set. You fit your model. Okay, you buy a whole bunch of stocks based on your model. The cross-validation component of that is a month later, are you broke or have you become very rich? A good model would have made you rich. A poor model would leave you broke. The difference here is that instead of waiting to collect new data, we're simulating that process with the data we already have. Under some strong assumptions, which I don't go into, if you're taking a stats class from me, I would explain all of the deep assumptions made in cross-validation, but generally it's pretty good. An interesting fact, the AIC criterion, the, the Akeike information criterion um, for comparing model fit is actually based on um, an information theoretic uh, version of cross-validation. So theoretically, AIC was designed to give you the same result you get from a cross-validation result, but collapsed into a single easy use statistic. Yeah. If you do the simulations, you'll find the AIC matches on the cross-validation very often pretty well. So I think it's based on leave one out cross-validation, which isn't the most aggressive thing. Anyway, tangents. So what we're going to do here, let's go through the process of doing our cross-validation. First thing is we need to pre-allocate to store all of these predictions. Okay? We're going to do tenfold cross-validation because that's a kind of a nice, easy round number. Um, we're going to split our data into tenfolds, and we're going to run models on each of those chunks of data with the fold left out. To do this, we need to make a new data frame that's going to hold our data and the sampled fold numbers, and we're going to add predictions to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the folds in our data using the sample function without replacement. The idea here is we want to randomly assign each row of our data to a different fold, so every fold has an equal chance of being in each, or every data point has an equal chance of being in each fold, but they're randomly assigned. The way to do that is this. So first I'm going to say, assign the number 10 to capital K. Capital K is going to control the iterations in our loops. That's how many folds we're going to have. <clears throat> I'm going to say, copy the sim data to a new data frame called CV predictions, which I'm going to add some stuff to. Then I'm going to add a column to it. CV predictions fold is going to index all 10 folds in our data. The way I do this is by saying, begin with a vector of the numbers 1 through 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but repeat 1 through 10 up to the number of rows in our data. There are 300 rows in our data, so this is going to be 1 through 10 repeated 30 times. Then I say, let's sample randomly from that vector with replacement equals false. There's 300 values in this vector right here which is each number 1 through 10 exactly 30 times. If we have replacement equals false, it's going to make sure every one of those values is selected. Once every one of those values of a single number is selected, it runs out and can't assign them anymore, which guarantees that we have randomly assigned every observation in our entire data set to fold 1 through 10, every single one randomly assigned with exactly 30 observations uh, of each fold. Let me show you what this is doing. So if I say, uh, let me first assign a equals 10. Okay. Oh, I haven't created CV predictions. 
Silly Chuck, what are you doing? There we go. Okay. So this is what is going on when I do that random sample. So the thing it's sampling from is this vector here. Oh, rep linked out in C0. Yeah. Okay. You'll notice here rep one through 10 length out equals the number of rows in CV predictions. This is 300 observations, but it's just the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then it repeats, and then it repeats, and then it repeats over and over again until there's 300 numbers. By randomly sampling from it, we just shuffle them at random. Sample is just taking that vector and shuffling it at random to make sure we don't have our rows going row one, row one is in fold one, row 10 is in fold 10, and so on. We just want to randomly distribute in case there's a pattern in our data. That is all I'm doing. Okay, so this creates a fold vector. Next thing I want to do, this is a neat shortcut. I know that I want to create a column of predictions for each one of my models. I can create a bunch of empty columns simultaneously like this. If I say CV predictions subset to a named vector, and that those names are vectors or columns that don't exist in the data frame, and I assign an NA to them, it creates blank columns in my data frame. This is a quick way of generating a whole bunch of empty columns in a data frame. See that magic? We've done it before with a single column. If I said CV predictions intercept only and assigned an NA to it, it would create a blank, an empty column called intercept only. Names models is this whole vector of all of these names. If I assign to it as a column index, I assign in A's, I get a whole bunch of empty columns. This is just a quick way for me to not do this four times, right? I'll run it here. I get the exact same result. Okay, this is just pre allocation. The idea here is that what we're going to do is we're going to loop over our values of X and Y fitting models, but then we're going to put a prediction in each one of these cells as we go. Okay, that's what our loops are going to do. And you'll see we're going to be looping over many rows of data and multiple columns. So we're going to use two different loops at the same time. Okay. So this is all the code for our cross validation in a single chunk. Let me talk about what we're doing here. The idea is that we will loop over each model, which is going to be mod, and within each model, loop over each fold, which is K, to fit a model and make predictions on it. So this right here is the same thing we've been looping over this entire time for a given model in the names of the models. So mod is going to be like intercept only. Then we're also going to loop over for lowercase k in 1 to 10. So this is going to be the numbers 1 through 10, one at a time. So let's walk through what a single iteration of this looks like. For the first iteration, mod is intercept only, and k is 10. So we're going to assign, create an object called fold rows. We're going to assign to it the CV predictions dollar sign fold equals equals K. So CV predictions dollar sign fold equals equals one for our first one is going to produce a logical vector of trues every time the, the data, the particular observation, the row in our data is in fold one. And it's going to produce a false when it's in any other fold than one. So this is just a true and false index which indicates what the given row of data is in our current fold or not, which we're going to use for subsetting. We're then going to create a temporary model, assign to it a linear regression model. The formula is, again, models subset to our current mod, which is intercept only. But the difference from our prior models we ran is we're going over a subset of the data. The data equals our CV predictions data set but not the fold rows. So the fold rows are the rows that we are in our current fold. If you remember this, the way cross-validation works, we want to not fit our model on the rows in the fold. So we say, this is trues and falses. The exclamation point turns the trues to falses, the falses to true. 
If you give a bunch of trues and falses in a position and subsetting, it drops all the falses and keeps the trues. This discards all the data in our fold rows and fits the model only to the data not in our current fold. So this model has been fit to 270 of our 300 observations. We then assign to our CV predictions data frame for the rows in our current fold and for the model we're currently on, so model is intercept only in our first iteration, we assign only to the 30 rows of our current fold the result of predicting using our temporary model, but our data is all the data in our CV predictions that is in our current fold. This is what that diagram I showed you earlier is. We fit the model on the data not in the fold, and we fit the predictions on the data that is in the fold. So this difference here, not the fold rows versus the fold rows. Okay, and that makes sense. It's okay if it doesn't. This is a fairly complicated thing. But if you have questions about it, let me know. The magic here is what's going on up here. So this code here runs one time for each model and for each fold. There's 10 folds and there's four models. So how many times does this code here run? Yeah, this loop makes all this code in here run 40 times. This is the magic of iterative operations and loops. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna run over all 10 folds first, then go to the next model and then run over all 10 folds and then go to the next model and then run all over 10 folds, go to the last model, run over all 10 folds. Iterative operations are confusing, but incredibly powerful. Okay, so chew on that in your brain. Due to time, I'm gonna keep moving along. <clears throat> so the next thing we wanna do is let's write another loop that can compute the mean squared error from our cross-validation predictions. The idea, right, is the squared error is just the difference between the real values and the predictions. We then square it and take the average of that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a vector called CVMSE. I'm going to assign to it set names, numeric length, the number of models. So it's going to be a blank numeric vector of length four, that's how many models we have, with names equal to the names of the models. It's this vector down here with no numbers in it yet. Intercept only, linear, quadratic, and cubic. I then say, again, for each model in the names of the models, we do this. I'm going to say my predicted squared error is equal to my actual CV predictions Y, so my actual Y value outcome, minus the predicted value of Y. So CV predictions intercept only is all the predicted values from our cross-validation of Y. We take all these differences, we square each one of them. That gives us a vector of all of our squared errors. We then take the mean of those vectors to get a single number for each model, which we assign to CV MSE intercept only, CV MSE linear, quadratic, and cubic. I display this vector, and this is the mean squared error for all of our models. In this particular toy example and this particular time I ran it, we even got the same mean squared error for quadratic and cubic. So our cubic model actually didn't do a bad job predicting our values. Okay. You look at this, the way mean squared error works is that a really easy metric. You don't care about the raw number, you care about which one had the lowest number. In this case, quadratic and cubic have the same number. If you have a simple model and a complex model and they do equally well, you always pick a simple model. Okay, so that was our CV. It's okay if it's too complicated for you, you don't like it. That is the hardest example we do in this entire class of anything but it's a useful thing and it's a good example of iterative operation. Here's a question in chat. Why don't you need piping for this code? Because I didn't feel like it. There's nothing that I don't think piping adds to it. I did this entirely using base R operations. Maybe you'll get an assignment to CSSS class that says something like, write your own CV code using only base R functions. I don't know, that could happen. You could do something with it with like this. <clears throat>
for this kind of operation, when I'm working with lots of lists, iterative operations and stuff, I very often just use pure base R. I don't think pikes would add anything useful anywhere in here. Um, but I would normally probably the way I might do CD cross validation is I would actually use um, package functions to do it. I want doing this manually. Like this entire operation could be done in like two or three lines of code, but I want to demonstrate the power of loops. Yeah. Okay. So now that was the peak. That was where the class, the hardest point of the class, you have hit the top of the mountain, and now we begin to roll down. So let's talk about some other things in those last 10 minutes here. Sorry for taking that much time on it, but it's kind of neat. So it's okay. Might go over time a little bit. You can leave at 520 if I do. Next, I want to talk about conditional flow, another fundamental programming thing that's basically the same in every programming language and is really useful. Okay. So conditional flow is about using if and else statements. So you've seen if else before the function if else here. What if else does is if else you give it a vector of like a logical vector and it performs some operation on it and spits out another vector. If and else are for taking a single true or false value and doing something with that. And usually what you use if and else for is conditionally executing some action. This is how you tell a piece of R code if it sees one number to run this code, but if it sees a different number, it runs another code. This is how every argument and every function you ever use in R works is a bunch of if else statements that do different things based on whether you give it a different value. Here's an example using a loop. I'm going to say for i in 1 through 10, do all this. This says if i, so for instance, 1 or 2 or 3, if i divided by 2 has a remainder of 0, print the number i is even. Else, if i is divisible by 3, print the number i is divisible by 3. Else, if neither of those things are true, the number i is not divisible by 2 or 3, and loop through all of this. What does this do? If I loop through the numbers 1 through 10, it tells me what numbers are divisible by 2 or 3 within the numbers 1 through 10. So it says the number 1 is not divisible by 2 or 3, number 2 is even, 3 is divisible by 3, 4 is even, 5 is not divisible by 2 or 3, but 6 is even, so on and so forth. Okay, so what conditional flow did in this example is it ran different print commands depending on what the value i was at the given time. Okay, this can be pretty powerful for doing all sorts of different things. And basically everything in your computer is based on a combination of loops and if else statements. So if you get really good at them, you could more or less recreate computing from the ground up. <clears throat> okay, so let's see more examples of this stuff. Uh, I think I've got, okay. Oh, is that all I have on if and else statements? Wow, okay, I really trimmed this lecture down this term. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna dwell on it. We'll experiment with them a lot more in uh, homework sections. So um, aside from that previous example, a really useful thing for if and else is when you need to handle special cases. Maybe when you're iterating over something in your loop, everything but a couple cases works fine, but those ones break. You could say when it encounters those cases, don't run the code or run some different code. This is nice for fixing problematic cases, ignoring things, stuff like that. It's also really nice for generating error messages. And the way every error message in every R function actually works is there's an if statement somewhere in there that when it detects something it's not expecting, spits out an error message. Error messages are generated using if else statements. So if you want to write your own functions that have error checking, if else statements are the way to do it. It's also the way I wrote that homework assignment that checks your, home, your values for homework four. It's all if else statements checking to see if your answers are valid or not. If they are, it says, good job. If they're bad, it says, no. That's basically how it works. OK, so here's an example of another common use for loops. Um, maybe what you need is uh, you got a lot of Excel files, maybe a lot of CSV files, and you want to load all those files in and combine them into one data set, but you don't really want to manually type in loading each one. This example here, I'm going to load in 10 files, but a common thing might be maybe you got hundreds of files. Manually loading in hundreds of files sucks. Don't do it. Make the computer iterate over it for you. So in this example, um, you can't actually run this unless you uh, copy down my entire class down to your computer because there's a, a whole bunch of CSV files basically in the directory. But 
imagine you got a directory, in this case, example data, that's stuffed with CSV files. List.files just gives you the file names of things in a directory. So lit file list is this text right here. It's all the CSV file names. I could say here, pre-allocate an empty data list, so a vector of type list with a number of slots equal to the number of files. Um, I'm going to teach you guys about Stringer here uh, in two weeks for manipulating uh, text. But basically, I just said uh, delete in file list the .csv names so that my data names are xdat1 instead of xdat1.csv. We'll get to there in week eight. And then I assign those names to my lists. And I have an empty list whose uh, elements are named xdat1 through 10. <clears throat> then I say, Let's load in the uh, reader library, because that's where my read CSV function is, for i in a sequence along all those files in my file list, write to data list, data names i is the name of each individual element of that list. So we're going to write one by one to each element of data list, the result of running read CSV on this path. The path is look in my example data folder, paste to that the actual file name like xdat1.csv, read it in, assign it to that element of the list. So this will go and read in one by one each of the 10 CSV files, assign it to an element of data list. So if I subset down to say the first element of data list, I can look and there's a data frame sitting there. So that's read in all my CSV files. If all those CSV files have the exact same format, they have the exact same column names, I can just say from dplyr, bind rows on this list, and it will turn it into one big data frame by combining every one of those list elements into a single data frame. In this case, it combined all the CSV file values into a single 10,000 row data frame. So if you got a whole bunch of files with an identical format in a folder, maybe hundreds of them, use this kind of code to read them in. Okay, next type of loop, I'm actually gonna show you an even faster way to do it, I think at the end. Next type of loop I wanna talk about is while loops. <clears throat> a lesser used looping structure, but still useful in R is the while loop. Rather than iterating over some predefined vector, this is a loop that just keeps going until some logical condition is no longer true. Here's an example. Let's figure out how many times we need to flip a coin to get four heads. We don't know how many times we've got to flip it, so we're going to keep flipping until we get four heads. I'm going to start by saying the number of heads is zero because we haven't started flipping yet. The number of flips we've done is zero because we haven't started flipping yet. While the number of heads we flipped is less than four, keep running all this code. So the current coin flip is the result of a draw, random draw for a binomial distribution. One draw of size one with probability 0 0.5. This right here randomly returns either a zero or a one with equal probability. Then if this coin flip was equal to one, I'm going to say increment the number of heads. So we take the current number of heads, add one, and overwrite number of heads with it. Then, whether or not it was heads, increment the number of flips by one. This keeps going until the number of heads is at least four. Then, when I knit these slides last time, last week, the number of flips that were required to get four heads was six. Every time you run this code, you might get a different answer because it has to flip a different number of coins. While loops are useful for that sort of simulation. Yeah. Interestingly enough, this exact same thing, how many times would you have to flip a coin to get a number of heads is actually what a negative binomial distribution measures. How many trials you have to get to get a given number of successes. So if you ever see a negative binomial model, it's based on that sort of distribution. Okay. So moving on. Last thing I want to talk about is vectorization. So if we had a large vector of numbers, here I've created a uh, 100 million draws from a standard normal distribution and assigned them to my vector. Let's say we want to add the number one to each one of those draws. I could do this with a loop. 
I could say this here for start proc time is me just starting a clock to see how long this operation took. I say, let's assign a new vector, which is a bunch of NAs equal to the length of my my vector. So this is a length 100 million NA vector. I then say, for a given possession, a position in one to 100 million, go assign to new vector that position, the result of my vector that position plus one. What this is going to do is it's going to go element by element down 100 million entries, adding one to each one of them and assigning the result of that to a new position in this vector. When I knit these slides last time, that took 95.11 seconds. Just, I think, the slowest I've ever seen that happen on my computer. So I clearly must have been running Zoom or something in the background when I knit these slides. Okay. That took 95 seconds to add the number one to every element of a vector. And I had to write all that code. Okay. Instead, I could do this say, my vector plus one and assign it to a new vector because R does that vector recycling for me. That took 0.17 seconds to do. So if I take how long it took to do that in the first way and divide it by the amount of time it took to do it using vector recycling, the vectorized method was 1051 times faster and I wrote drastically less code to do it. The reason for this is it's doing the same operation, but R knows how to do this in a much more efficient way than doing it with a loop. There's many operations in R which are under the hood of R vectorized or written in a faster programming language or handled by the math library on the computer. It can do them way faster than doing it for a loop. Okay, so loops don't just suck to write as you've seen this entire lecture. They're also slow. They have very few redeeming values. Okay. So the idea I want to get is after traumatizing with all that loop stuff, I want you to remember that and do whatever is possible to not write a loop in the future. So there's lots of functions in R that do things you might do with a loop for you so you don't have to write a loop. For instance, if you want the sums of your rows or your columns, the means of your rows or the means of your columns, use those functions and don't write a loop. If I have a matrix that looks like this, and I want to get the row sums of the matrix, I can say row sums of that matrix and it will give them to me and I don't have to write a loop. This is way better than writing any loop in any situation. It's one function call. It may even have a loop inside of it that somebody else wrote, so they had to do the difficult job. You don't have to, okay? Don't write loops whenever you can. Other examples of these are cumulative sums, cumulative products, cumulative minimums, cumulative maximums. So if I say, give me the cumulative sum of one through seven, oh my God, there's the cumulative max, the cumulative sum of one through seven, so I didn't have to write a loop to do it. Things like position maximum, position minimum, will take position max, for instance, takes a bunch of vectors, and it tells you what is the highest number in each position of these vectors. So it's gonna look at the first position of each vector and return the highest number. In this case, it's two for the first position, two for the second position, and four for the third position. Two, two, four. Didn't have to write a loop to do it. Pmax does it for me. Okay. So here's another example of this even more mind blowing. I showed you a loop a bit ago for looping over a whole bunch of files and reading them into a data frame. That sucks. If they're all the same, don't do it. I'll show you a faster, better way. Vroom is a package I mentioned earlier in the class for reading in CSV files at high speed. Vroom doesn't just read in CSV files once really fast. Vroom can read in an entire directory really fast simultaneously. If I say vroom vroom on a list of files, right, to my complete data, it will go through every single file that's in that list of files, read them in one at a time, and then stitch them together into a data frame. Okay, so it did all that thing I did with the loop in one go. This only works, of course, if they all have column names that are the same, but it burned through them all in super high speed. I can take a look at it and it did it right. If I've got a directory that has a thousand CSV files in it, Vroom will read them in. I actually do have a directory on my computer that has 
200,000 CSV files in it for a particular project, or I used to have it on it for a particular project, Vroom read it in, in the time it took me to go 30 seconds, zap my coffee and come back with it. It had read in all, I want to say, what was it? It was about 50 gigs into memory in like 30 seconds. Like that capped out the, the transfer speed of my solid state drive, basically. It's fast. Okay. So do stuff like that. Your homework assignment is just part two of last week's homework. Do Midnight Tuesday. We're going to go over it in lab. Okay. Uh, on uh, Wednesday of next week, I'm going to go even more into never writing loops again. It's important that I teach you about them, but they suck. So that is the high unpleasant point of the class for a reason. I want to show you their power and then spend the rest of the term dissuading you from writing them. Okay. That's all I got. Sorry for going uh, five minutes over. Um, you got questions? Hit me. Um, <clears throat> okay. Ah, this is an excellent question. If we didn't see the matrix in the past 10 to 15 minutes, are we toast for homework? No, not at all. It is perfectly fine if you didn't. I have no expectation that you fully understand anything you encounter in this class. My class is a fire hose. Sometimes you take the right sip from it and you immediately get it, or sometimes you can manage to expand your mouth to accept the entire flow of the fire hose. Typically, you cannot. These are very complex topics here. This is the hardest lecture of the class. If you didn't get it, that's fine. It took me a really long time to understand writing loops. I'll slide out say it. It took me forever. Okay, I found it very difficult. My goal is to try and minimize the trauma of loops while simultaneously telling you over and over again that they are legitimately very difficult. And when you get like some computer science person in your life who's always like, oh, loops are super easy. You can tell them to shut up, okay? They're not super easy. They're difficult, okay? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Share, stop recording.